Good day, Bootube. I've not been doing a... Well, it feels like I've not done a video for a while, so I thought I'd just do a bit of an update. So I finished um, an introduction to poetry as a uh, like self-improvement bit of reading for contextualising poetry and better understanding form and expression and things like that. So that was very informative. But at the moment, I've uh, scrolled away any other reading I was doing. So I was at the, I had just started The Pearl by John Steinbeck. But I've shelved that as well because, as you can see on the screen, I'm focusing on James Joyce's Ulysses in a read-along hosted by Greg and Alan, who I'll uh, quote in the update below. And I just wanted to give a bit of an update of how it's going so far, really. So, uh, books one and two were... Books one and two, sorry. Episode one, episode two, or chapter one, chapter two. Uh, there's many different ways it's named. So it can either be Chapter 1, Episode 1, or Telemachus. Or it could be Episode 2, Chapter 2, or Nesta. Uh, so it, it's it's odd. So the, obviously the book's kind of uses as a scaffolding uh, Homer's epic, The Odyssey. And basically we're reimagining uh, Odysseus and various other characters and bringing them into this story and retelling that story again, but through the course of stream of consciousness writing over the course of one day, so similar to uh, Virginia Woolf, Mrs. Dalloway, in that sense. And so far, I just want to, in fairness to it, episode, uh, one and two, so Telemachus and Nestor, uh, got through them very quickly, surprisingly quickly. Obviously, I think apart from... So I am apart from the other people involved in the group a little bit in that they've got more interest or inclination to read with the aids of the other resources available to them. So other academic works or contextual works going into the more into the weeds of the actual narrative and various reference points and stuff like that, uh, which I've not been doing, which I've not been doing. I think that would, if I return to it for a reread, I would do. Because obviously on a reread you get more out of it and I, I wouldn't be as blindsided by it. So I don't, I want to stay in the moment as much as possible whilst reading it. But I, I still I still Google things. I, I Google things with books all the time or check my dictionary and look at various terms or... Uh, is it Brewster's or Brewer's? I can never remember. Uh, Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable. Uh, that's a good resource as well for looking at various things. Um, but yeah, it's it's very deep. So obviously you've got the parallel. You kind of got well, like a parallel perpendicular structure of the Odyssey next to you. Then you've also got to bear in mind that it's clearly the same type of thing. Like if you imagine you're in the lane of a road, there's a parallel lane to your right, which is the Odyssey. There's a parallel lane to your left, which is ve well lanes almost probably various levels of structure from. Uh, Shakespeare as well. Then there's also a lot of seventeenth and eighteenth century works that I, I have no idea about. So uh, outside of it being written in English with Irish terminology, there's a lot of quoted Latin, there's quoted Greek, there's quoted French, and those quotes seem to fit the moment of the story, but usually are paraphrased. Uh, cribbed lines from other people's works and it's, it's a lot sometimes because it, it can happen like sentence after sentence after sentence can be like uh, this Italian author's work on uh, polemic against whatever it is it's like a what is it Arianism crops up so we're also dealing with uh, refutations of the Reformation and is the father above the son and the holy spirit is the son above the holy spirit but below the father and all these different multifaceted layers and it's definitely i'm definitely getting it but chapter three episode three or chapter three proteus is just whew, mind boggling rather mind boggling and it's just hard to track in fairness 
it's really hard to track. Uh, but and then also personally, I think they've because I'm not potentially as well as well as deeply read as. Uh, in fact, can I? Can we see it here? So that blue book there is. Oh, oh it looks like a point. Sorry, the, the, <laughs> it has a disgusting perspective. My finger is not actually pointing at it for the purposes of the camera angle. It is. It was, that just threw me off then because I was really confused. Uh, that's me actually pointing at it. But uh, that book there, the blue book there, that is the complete works of Shakespeare. Uh, to my shame, I've never I bought it years ago. I've never cracked it open, apart from maybe to peruse some sonnets. And that has been it. I have not, I have never read a single Shakespeare play. I've watched various adaptations and various truthful adaptations. So I was like, the, oh, what's his name now? From Titanic, whatever he's called. Jack from Titanic. Uh, his Romeo and Juliet, which is like a somewhat modernised this version, but keeps the dialogue. In fairness, having small children, uh, the BBC Children's Channel, CBBS. They do a lot of Shakespeare adaptations and other adaptations and are true to the dialogue. And the kids are just on board with it, so that's great. So in a sense, I've seen quite a few adaptations, but I haven't actually read any. So some of the parallels being drawn to Shakespeare, I'm not getting. Uh, who was it? Was it, was it Depp or somebody in the Discord chat? Uh, referenced Iago. Diego, it's Diego, the villain from. Oh, don't even remember. Don't remember. I'm I'm so not versed in it. I can't even remember what it was, but whoever it was, and they mentioned the fact that it's a quote from that character, but it's been flipped. And I'm I'm drawing parallels to other things that I I do have familiarity with. So, for example, for me, I can very much see. Especially in that uh, episode one, Telemachus, Malachi Mulligan or Book Mulligan, I would a hundred percent draw parallels between him and Wilkins Micawber from David Copperfield. It's it's so bombastic, and it's just cra crazy the way that character plays out. And then, but then equally so, it also feels like again to make another. David Copperfield parallel. It feels like at various points the narrator, either Joyce himself, or Joyce's id, I, the ego, whatever it is of this character, or as the narrator, or whether it's Stephen Dedalus as the character, is very much like a. What's his name? Richard. Babley. Whoever is it? Oh, Mister Dick, that character who just. He has to run off and just start writing this sentence about, is it about the king or whatever, is it about King Charles? And it's just it, that that type of spontaneous madness, which is very much present because of the stream of consciousness thing. It just feels like, I, I don't know where we're going. It feels like moment to moment and sentences where, I don't even remember if this has happened, but this is just like the stream of consciousness sensation is, this is the thought but I'm going to express it with alliteration, but alliteration set within ancient Egypt or Babylon or Greece or Rome or the Holy Land. It, it just seems to be like, what? <laughs> and the next, the next sentence is a different thought and a different place and a, potentially a different rhyme scheme and different anaphora taking place or there's lots of word playing schemes going on things like that. I, I don't and just to clarify by schemes I don't mean schemes in the do I mean schemes or what was the thing now sorry no I'm, I thought I was speak, misspeaking then because I, I am aware that there is a what's it, what's it called uh, schemas two variations of the same schema I think it is I was I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to do too much pre-reading because I don't want to but I, I know there's a resource there available to if you need to, which so it's um well, I've, got, I've got it listed somewhere. Uh either the Linati, Linati, don't even pronounce it, Linity schema or the Gilbert schema, which kind of helped to 
break down the structure of it. But so far it is, it is going well. And then obviously, sorry, sorry, I just waxed lyrical then about Telemachus a bit and the character in there and Buck Mulligan and stuff like that. And obviously I do get the reference point of Stephen Dedalus having a homophonic namesake for Dedalus from Icarus and Dedalus. So that's an interesting point to me. And then we've just started, or I've just got to, um, sorry, well, I've taken away the focal point of this video. Um, in fact, I don't even have, I have it on my phone, damn it. Okay, so the scheme is we're reading chapters or episodes, uh, one to six in this first week. So, Thermicus, Nestor, Proteus are done. So I'm now, I've just started Calypso, episode four. Then it'll be Lotus Eaters, episode five, and Hades as episode six. So, and I have read the Odyssey and the Iliad a long time ago. And probably didn't get it. <laughs> probably still wouldn't get necessarily all of it now. Um, but, yeah, so it's, it's, it's definitely getting there. So I do get some of the references, like, and it's on Hades is the underworld or whatever it is. And various things. I just think, there was a point made, actually. Uh, and then I Googled it. <laughs> it was a thing, but probably the writer was asked. So everybody's favourite TV, children's TV program at the moment seems to be Bluey. And the father character in that, when asked if he's playing, when he's playing a game with his children, if he's asked what his name is, if he's the patient in a hospital game or whatever they're playing, he gives the name Telemachus. And, which I think is interesting. And then also the main two, the main child's teacher is called Calypso. So they were asked, is there a... Because I, I, obviously I can't pick up on it because this is the first time I'm reading Ulysses. But they were asking, is that is that a, are you going for that type of thing? Is like a Ulysses angle here? Are you retelling the Odyssey through anthropomorphic dogs? And apparently the answer was no. It's the characters' names were loosely chosen and inspired by Ulysses thirty one, which is a children's cartoon from many moons ago. But that in itself is a retelling of the Odyssey, but set in space. So it's set in the future, but follows the same type of grand sweeping epic st story but as an animation and oh, I've really not got a super amount to say about the book so far because so much of it is beyond what I'm aware of and I'm, I'm okay to stick with that because I feel like first and foremost that would be people's experience of it not everybody who got their hands upon this sensational book at the time. Or even still to this day, have a, have a clue about what's actually going on. Like the actual story just seems to be, it's a, it's people, it's a one day in the life in a certain place following several characters. And that's it, like the beats of the story, I think, um, was it a clip from Salman Rushdie explaining it? In like less than a paragraph, and the, the the actual story is very straightforward, and relatively not very eventful. Like it's a small world story, no, no grand thing necessarily is at stake. But because of all the hierarchies and reference points and stuff like that, I can get why it's elevated. But I don't believe. I don't think. I'm, with anything like this, I'm ever going to be willing to have, have already drank the Kool-Aid before we've started. And I've, I've always had that opinion of everything. I don't like, whether it's positive or negative, I don't like gatekeeping around any type of content. You shouldn't necessarily tell people that this, this thing isn't worth reading. And basically, I just... just the gist of just take my word for it don't even bother because there may be something there for you there may not be something there for you but you need to discover that personally and i feel like there's a lot of hype around ulysses which so far even though i'm not far into the story i don't get why i'm, I'm technically impressed 
by elements to it because it is technically impressive but it's technically impressive to me the same way that uh, chat GPT is technically impressive or the the way that AI things are technically impressive but then also flawed but people don't want to seem to see the flaws so what's it called um, there's a there's an AI chat that you can listen to called something like The Never Ending Conversation by Slavoj Zizek and oh, a filmmaker whose name I'm going to, going to remember. But I think he's a German film. Werner, Her Werner Herzog? I think he's Werner Herzog. And basically, they, they, they've like been... Their vocal patterns and stuff like that have been replicated as best as possible. And... Their recorded speeches and dialogues and things like that. So they, it can talk back and forth between itself like those two people. But by but quickly you realise that by virtue of the fact that it's endless, at some point, if I click long enough and go into the next bit that one says to the next person and then that person's reply, and I keep going down further enough, you will eventually get to a point where Werner Herzog is just, in all caps, basically shouting sausages at Slavoj Zizek, while Slavoj Zizek is doing a high-pitched whine, singing a song about the moon. Do you know what I mean? Because it, ha it ha by default, it has to. Just because things are technically impressive doesn't mean it's not... It doesn't, doesn't also mean, it, therefore, it's perfect. And I feel like there's an element of that here where this is such a... such a highbrow thing held in such highbrow circles... But it feels like if, if you were to say you didn't like it, there's going to be that strange string, strange strand of people who will say, well, you just didn't get it. Like the, the fault must be yours in rather than it's a fault with the book. But I had the same thing with the, I'm very, very waffly, but it does all come back full circle to the, the, the type of book it is. So I read Lud in the Mist by Hope Murleys, which I thought was a brilliant fantasy political escapade uh, and then also read her narrative stream of consciousness poem Paris which was just too much it was just too much it's not accessible it's not apart from a few bits I was able to appreciate again it had an, uh, a section in the back of the book with all the references explaining all the things and it's like yeah but if I wasn't somebody Staying a long while in Paris in the 1920s or whatever it was, or well versed in Parisian culture, there being reference to three specific type of posters you'd see on a specific subway line at that specific time is wasted. It doesn't. It doesn't. After that moment's passed, and you and then you and you're not looking it up. The initial reading is wasted. So I, I know I'm banging about this a lot, but it's true of everything. Philip Larkin's saying a poem should be readable and understandable. Sorry, it should be understandable upon first reading. And then you can peel back the layers of the onion. That should be true of Ulysses. I should be able to get a story out of this. And then peel back the onion layers. But it feels like there's, it feels like there's a lot of onion layers... And the story is very small in comparison so far. But, like I say, it's still at very early doors. And we've still got a long way to go, obviously. So it's, it's over, like I say, it's over June and July. Uh, Greg and Alan are hosting it. Uh, and Greg set up the Discord channel, so I'll leave links below to their channels, respectively. And then if you want to join in and try and catch up or what have you, or dip in or resume if you've been reading it before maybe and you want to pick up at a certain point, then you can do that and see what we're talking about. But uh, it'll definitely be worthwhile to have done the, the read of the book because it does tick, up a, tick off a white whale. And yeah, I'm intrigued to see what how much there is there in Ulysses. Oh, and I've rambled for nearly 20 minutes. So I will stop there and let everybody get back to their lives. But thank you, BookTube.